you ask a lot of questions. Actually, what you do a lot is tell me that you really like my videos, and I really appreciate that. And as I say, I do read and reply to all of your comments and questions, as long as they're relevant and civil. I thought it might be fun today to chat about a few questions you've asked recently and give a little more insight and detail. So this is about the 180 rule as it applies to shutter speed. There's another 180 rule for camera positioning and in-camera raw processing. Chris asked about shooting video at 24p with the Sony a6000 at f2.8. He wondered whether he should use the 180 rule and use a shutter speed of 1 50th instead of 1 60th. Tony wondered how to set a camera to 1 48th, the exact shutter required for the 180 degree rule when shooting at 24 frames. I told Chris that any shutter speed between 1 30th and 1 60th would be fine. But let me elaborate first on the 180 rule. In the old days, the film in a motion picture camera had to be stopped in the gate for the exposure, and then while it was moved to the next frame, the shutter needed to be closed. In those days, film needed lots of light and was expensive to produce, and of course, they needed the projection of the still images to look like motion. Balancing all of those parameters, the industry standardized on 24 frames per second as the speed to move the film, and provided one half of the time to expose the frame, and the other half to move the film to the next frame. So exposure for each frame was 1 48th of a second. The shutter, a rotating disc that enabled this, was cut with a 180 degree opening, and as it turned, it would expose the frame for 1 48th of a second, and then allow another 1 48th of a second for the camera to move the film to the next frame. That slow shutter speed meant that a certain amount of blur would occur with motion, and mostly through luck, it turned out that amount of motion blur also helped viewers perceive the motion, even though each frame is a still image. Well, whether it's in our genetic DNA or not, we accept this blur in movies and interpret it as motion. Today, of course, you can make the shutter speed whatever you want, although Tony's requested 1 48th is exceedingly rare. Some cameras provide a much slower shutter speed, an effect I enjoy, but all provide faster shutter speeds. Faster shutter speeds mean that there's less or no motion blur. It seems imperceptible, and you'd think that a clear image without blur is preferable, but no. If you see a video with a too fast shutter speed, you'll know there's something odd. The motion looks jittery and jumpy instead of smooth. Now, whether you're shooting at 24, 25, or 30 frames per second, 160 or so is the right shutter speed to use. If it's dark, where quick action is less likely, 1 30th usually works fine and provides some low light latitude. One exception. If you're shooting at high frame rates like 60, 120, or above, because you intend to slow the footage down, use a higher shutter speed. Probably double the frame rate and there's the 180 rule at work again. One note, if you're shooting outside on a sunny day, trying to shoot with a slow shutter speed like 1 60th and a wide aperture can be challenging. So be prepared with an ND filter. Now, just to circle back for Chris, by all means, if you're shooting 24 frames, shoot at 1 50th. But it's not really different from shooting at 1 60th. And for Tony, there's no perceptible difference between 1 48th and 1 50. In fact, if there's someone who can tell a 24 frame video shot at 1 50th from a 24 frame video shot at 1 60th, particularly when it's shown on an illuminated screen instead of a reflected projection, I'd love to meet them. Thanks for asking. Michael wrote to complain about Sony's lack of in-camera raw processing. Big Bad Bosco complained that Nikon Snapbridge wouldn't transfer raw images, and Quotub complained I didn't detail the raw processing features on the Fuji X-T20. Well, first, why shoot raw? Well, why not? Memory cards are cheap, and raw files record all of the information the sensor captured and don't bake in white balance or several other in-camera color, brightness, contrast, and sharpness settings before the file gets compressed to a JPEG. RAW enables you to manage, 
modify, and adjust those settings later at your leisure when you have the benefit of a larger calibrated screen and time to carefully ponder and evaluate several different adjustments. The biggest benefit, even if your camera creates great JPEGs, is the ability to recover highlights and or shadows with the extensive controls provided by applications like Lightroom and Photoshop. It doesn't happen often, but it does, and the ability to make those adjustments has saved many images for me. Well, I agree with Michael. Sony's playback features are overall less than the competition, and I apologize to Quotub for not providing a little more detail on what Fuji does provide. But for me, the nagging issue behind all of these comments, including Big Bad Bosco's complaint about transferring via Wi-Fi, is that I don't think mobile devices are up to the task. RAW files are big. Transferring via Wi-Fi will take time. Most cameras scale your JPEGs down further before transferring via Wi-Fi. And making the fine-tuning adjustments that I want, I just can't see doing them on a 3-inch LCD that can't be calibrated. But I will provide a little more information on the in-camera RAW conversion feature, and I'll continue to complain about Sony's lack of support. But really, my heart's not in this one. And hey, thanks for writing. I do appreciate it when you take the time to communicate with me. It is one of the pleasures of producing videos for my channel. Your comments and questions help me to understand the real issues that you're facing. And thanks for watching. Your comments are always welcome but they are moderated and please keep it civil. If you're so inclined, please subscribe.